Okay, hey, hey, Wealth Builders, Simon Dixon here, and welcome to episode 26 of Bitcoin Hard Talk. This is where we talk hard talk about hard money. I've been involved in Bitcoin investing and money for over two decades, obsessing with the subject. And today, as part of Bitcoin Hard Talk episode 26, I'm actually experimenting with a new format. So if you're on Twitter, I'm actually live on YouTube right now and also doing a live video. Um, if you'd like the visuals, visuals, you can switch over to the video. But also, if you want to carry on listening in space, audio only, um, then for the second half of this, after I've covered the bulk of the content, um, I'll be inviting you up to ask questions on Twitter Spaces. So if you've got a question, uh, feel free to put your hand up now. And once we're done with the live broadcast, we're going to be going through the latest in this week in Bitcoin, this week in Macro, and this week on the geopolitical side. So you can put your hand up and we'll bring you up later for the AMA section. And we're experimenting with this, seeing if this all works. So without further ado, let's jump straight into the main topic of today. The first half we're going to be doing this week in Bitcoin, this work in macro, and this week in geopolitics. And then in the second half, we're going to be talking about the news of whether Ethereum ETH is a security based upon the fact that there have been reports that the uh, SEC is coming after the Ethereum Foundation, and we're going to be discussing all about it and whether that impacts Bitcoin, how that impacts the wider crypto market, and why those decisions are very important for somebody analyzing the investment landscape at the moment. So um, without further ado, uh, let's jump into the first bit of news. So the first bit of news on Bitcoin is we all know that one of the largest holders of Bitcoin is, in fact, the U.S. government, because the U.S. government seizes Bitcoins from anyone that engages in crime. We all know that uh, Bitcoin is pseudonymous, which means you can own your own money and you can spend it from person to person. And in order to eliminate the need for a bank or a central bank, we have miners performing the role of central bank. And we have a blockchain which transparently reports every single transaction, but they don't know who those transactions are connected to. So if you're committing any form of crime that the government doesn't want you to take, then eventually they may be able to connect those transactions with an identity eventually, um, even though you can have as many transactions, as many wallets as you want. Um, and so that is how it works. And we know from seizures from criminal enterprises, um, that uh, those the, those have been confiscated by the U.S. government. Um, in fact, we had about 130 million, about 2,000 Bitcoin that was sent to Coinbase. Coinbase is a Bitcoin exchange, one of the largest in the industry, publicly traded. Um, at Bank to the Future and myself, we invested in some of the earlier rounds when it was a private company, but 2,000 Bitcoins were sent. So they still have approximately 209 Bitcoin. And the U.S. government is stupid because the U.S. government gets to print dollars. And can you imagine if you had a license to print dollars and you decide that it's a good move to buy dollars with your Bitcoin? Bitcoin is digital hard sound money. There'll only ever be 21 million of them and millions of them have been lost. And you decide to take the scarcest form of digital currency and money that has ever existed in humankind and use it to purchase a currency that always and has lost 99% of its value um, because you decide that that's the right thing to do. If I were the U.S. government, I'd be having that in my central bank reserves and I'd be adding it as an asset on my balance sheet ready for the new world of Bitcoin and central bank digital currency. So anyway, because they were selling that 130 million odd and they were going to be sending more, that led to a bit of a correction in the Bitcoin price. And those that don't get the fundamentals, it crashed down to approximately $64,000. Um, and those that don't have the conviction and an understanding of the economics of Bitcoin might have been scared into selling their Bitcoin. On other news, we got lots of news from the court cases, everything that happened throughout 2022, 2023. 
the U.S. District Court of New York, um, which uh, was uh, Gemini and Genesis, two of the companies that uh, were one of them is a subsidiary of Digital Currency Group, one of the largest conglomerate of uh, Bitcoin companies. Um, they were being sued by the uh, the New York attorney and they denied the dismissal of those cases with the SEC. Um, and uh, so that that lawsuit will not be dismissed. Um, there was also an announcement with BlackRock engaging in its next play within the, I guess you'd call it wider crypto market. And that is a game that we've been playing in for a long time, which is security tokens. Um, they guess they call these things the uh, different things now, real world assets or tokenized securities or whatever you want to call it now. Um, but they were originally called security tokens. Well, BlackRock, alongside Coinbase and a company that I'm also a shareholder in, Securitize, they launched their tokenized securities fund and it was sold out for $250 million. And they're doing what we did a long time ago in 2014 at Bank to the Future, where we launched securities that would pay Bitcoin dividends. It was one of the reasons that many of our investors got incredibly wealthy um, because we were paying out daily Bitcoin dividends and we were paying out thousands of Bitcoin every single day. Uh, and it was backed by mining and that particular product. Uh, this one's backed by traditional products. Uh, but this is BlackRock's next enter entrance, I guess, into the market. Um, and so uh, just so you know as well, um, Securitize is a regulated broker dealer to be able to offer tokenized securities. And at one stage in 2018, Coinbase ended up buying our broker dealer from Bank to the Future to be able to offer digital securities in the future. They haven't done those yet, but we look forward to seeing that industry progress. At the moment, they're playing custody to those transactions. It, it was a while since we last went live because we had to miss one. Um, for uh, uh, But we all know as well that SBF, uh, we've been talking about it for a while, he was convicted for 25 years in prison. Now, people were complaining that that's enough, not enough. Others were saying it's too much. Um, you decide, but the judge decided that 25 years was enough. And probably I hear from legal friends that uh, if he has good behavior, that would be about 12 years. This is a multi-billion dollar fraud. But one of the things we won't let him get away with is that he was saying that he tried to use it, that he made creditors 100% whole. We've covered it in previous episodes of Bitcoin Hard Talk that that is definitely not the case. He is using the bankruptcy code in order to make people think that that is what was happening. Um, and so also, what else did we have? So that's 25 years. You know, when you compare that with other cases like Ross Ulbrich that created the Silk Road, which was a website, essentially technology that put together people that wanted to transact in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, he got life in prison, 175 years for creating that technology. SBF scammed people um, out of billions of dollars by combining a hedge fund with a crypto exchange and using client money. Um, and uh, we also have the Mazinski case, which was literally um, scamming people. I just found out actually um, recently um, that Mazinski, there is a connection with the fact that he used to be on the Israeli Defense Force. Um, I did not know that until I researched a little bit further. Um, but it turns out that the whole Ponzi scheme was operated by, um, you know, a, a bunch of co-founders in Israel. Um, now, the ones, because he stayed in America, he's actually facing up to 115 years. But the others in Israel, they're actually creating startups with the prime minister's office of um, Israel. Um, go figure. Um, and so, you know, that's, uh, you know, those uh, securities are also being created. Um, what else have we covered? Um uh, we also had, uh, which I think will be coming out, the Tornado Cash. Um, this is where people are creating software that allows you to obfuscate your uh, transactions. I talked in the beginning about transactions being you know, available online, but you don't know who actually did it. Well, Tornado Cash was doing it with Ethereum. We'll be talking a bit more about Ethereum being a security and what that means for the industry today in the second half. But $1.2 billion of money laundering happened through Tornado Cash. 
um, do you, you know, connected to North Korean hackers. Um, and they are actually coming after the developer. Um, we're going to be finding out a bit more about that case and what happens there. Um, but, you know, this is mixing software. And so really, if you think about all these cases, it is about a new emerging trend. What happens with open source technology is the person, the developer that creates the technology responsible for any types of crimes that happen with it? Everything is being rolled out in real time in terms of what is going to be happening uh, with that at the moment. Uh, so we'll continue to watch that with interest. Um, it was, uh, I think it's Lazarus, the, 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 the North Korean um, hacker group that uh, we can, that will, that is allegedly using that. Um, we also had um, regulators, I think it was uh, coming after KuCoin, a cryptocurrency exchange that didn't bother to register as a money transmitter. Now, money transmitters are subject to the Bank Secrecy Act, and the Bank Secrecy Act means that you need to know all of your customers um, and report any suspicious transactions to the government, punishable by prison sentence. And so KuCoin is now, they were essentially doing billions of dollars of transactions with American residents, pretending that they weren't transacting with American companies. Um, and so that they have been charged with uh, creating an illegal, uh, without serving as a money transmitter, because they weren't doing Know Your Customer, and so American people could sign up, even though they were making it out that they weren't. And that is in violation of the US Bank Secrecy Act, which is not something that you mess with. At the same time, there was an interesting bit of news. So with Coinbase, as we said, they're having their court case with the SEC about whether they need to be a uh, securities exchange. But it was ruled by the judge, and this is very important news, that Coinbase Wallet, which is what is known as a self-custody wallet, which means that they create the technology for you to be able to own your own Bitcoin and own your own coins and store the ability to access those on your device, on your phone, or wherever you hold the backup key. Um, well, those self-custody uh, wallet is essentially... Um, Coinbase wallet allows you to do. It was even though it charged transaction fees, um, it was determined that these are not subject to unlicensed securities brokerage. Essentially, what that means is that this is a big step forward for software developers that want to develop the ability for you having wallets where you own the key, they have no access, and you can still charge a fee even if you have US customers without actually being responsible because you don't hold custody over those. So this is a big development. Um, and uh, But at the same time, Coinbase, the centralized service, they are still being pursued for being an unregistered broker, an unregistered in exchange in terms of securities, and so this is the territorial battle, despite the fact that they are already registered as a money transmitter. The company went public, which required SEC approval, um, and Coinbase is fighting that. And based upon the SEC's track record, it looks like they may be on a losing streak with that. We shall see. Um, but as I said, this is good for open source technology and the future of self-custody within the US. This was a victory for freedom. You can now officially, with this ruling, if this has implications by case law upon other cases, you can self-custody um, and people can develop self-custody applications. So that is all of the updates I'm going to be covering on the Bitcoin side and the wider market. Now let's jump into the macro side. Now, this week, gold reached new all-time highs. Historically, Gold reaches new all-time highs when macro and geopolitics are bad. This is a fear investment. It's a fear-based investment. And Bitcoin reaching new all-time highs, I believe, is 100% a sense of the geopolitical environment that we find ourselves in. With that announcement, there was an interesting little pump and dump scheme that happened on the stock market, which is a gold mining company. Um, it was announced that they're going to be purchasing 
um, about $1.7 billion worth of Bitcoin at the time. I think it was 24,000 Bitcoin they announced. This immediately pumped the price of Bitcoin. And it turns out that it is a very small cap, um, you know, dying little penny stock that was only really worth about, uh, you know, $5 million or so. Um, but the headline was interesting in itself. If I were a gold miner, I would be using the fact that I could leverage raising funds on the capital markets, just like Michael Saylor does, in order to hedge against my gold mining operation with Bitcoin in order to supercharge it over all of the other Bitcoin miners, sorry, gold miners. Um, and so while this is a, um, you know, it turned out to be just a little bit of a scheme in order to pump the price of a stock, um, it was actually probably a move that could have worked out very well if they could have leveraged that stock price in order to make that Bitcoin purchase. And it was just a plan that they wanted to do as opposed to something they were actually doing. Um, I've just been told for some reason um, my internet connection on the island internet is making me look like a bit of a robot on the video. Uh, do apologize for that. The show must go on. What else did we have on the macro side? Well, obviously, one of the big parts of the Bitcoin success story that some of you that weren't around in the 2013 earlier markets may not know is that one of the big use cases for Bitcoin was actually coming against the financial blockade of WikiLeaks. And WikiLeaks is a tool for freedom of speech to hold governments accountable. And we found out that Julian Assange is facing all sorts of allegations um, and uh, is considered somebody that needs to be extradited to the US and the UK government are complicit in that process. But there was a small victory. Julian Assange, in terms of the outruling, it was meant to be this week, but whether he gets extradited was actually delayed. At the same time, the UK decided that this is the time to start slapping some sanctions on China uh, due to some kind of uh, cyber warfare that was happening between the UK. Um, it wasn't a full-blown sanction. It was reported, and sometimes the headlines um, got a little bit ahead of themselves, but it was for certain specific companies that were engaging in some of that cyber warfare between the UK and China. Also, at the same time, kind of related to the geopolitical side, we saw a bit of a backtracking, and maybe I should be saving this for the geopolitical side, um, on terms of their uh, connecting Israel to war crimes and breaches of international law. Um, and that was happening as a result of certain people being massacred. I think I'm going to be covering that in the geopolitical side. But, you know, when 35,000 Palestinians get massacred, as soon as a couple of English people get massacred, then suddenly it is a war crime, but it wasn't a war crime before. And obviously that has been escalating. I'll cover it more where the macro side starts to intersect with the geopolitical side, but oil started to rise this week above $90. For those of you that don't remember, the COVID money printing and the uh, Russian and Ukrainian um, situation, um, which originally pumped oil price to the point where grandma and granddad were choosing between either heating or eating because their gas bills were getting so high. That, when it went up to a peak of $124, created a crisis that led to central banks all around the world hiking their rates because of a hyperinflationary cycle that broke the financial system and broke banks. And you remember in the UK, it literally caused a run on the UK pension system that led to, I think it was Liz Truss, the prime minister, having to retire at the time. But if you don't like those inflationary prices and choosing between eating and heating, then we better calm down some of the situation that our government's egged on on the geopolitical side. So oil reaching $90 is getting close to some of those peaks. And that's one of the side effects of backing some of this thing. So let's jump in before we go into Ethereum being a security and the impact. Let's jump into some of the geopolitical situation. So just quickly, sorry. if you were watching. Sorry, hey, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Could uh, 
we're obviously doing this for the first time uh, in a while, actually. Um, on your X space, you got yourself as mute, so ah, uh, so yourself. all that time I was on mute and you didn't interrupt me earlier. No <laughs> apologies, there. I, I just ch uh, checked that now. So, okay, yeah. awesome. Um, thanks, Sazad. Um, right, so I'm unmuted, and we lost all of our audience on X spaces. Um, I did actually unmute it in the beginning, and some reason it must have gone back. Um, but if you are on X spaces, um, you will now have the, you can go back to the recording. We are now, we've done this week in Bitcoin. We've done this week in terms of the macro side. And now we are doing the geopolitical side before we go into the main part of the second topic, the impact of the reports that the SEC is allegedly coming after ETH for being a security. Well, this week we could not talk on the geopolitical side other than anything else that is freaking out the world right now. And that is that Iran was pushed to escalation. So we may even be seeing an escalation as I speak because I've been in board meetings and I've been um, out of action. So I may not be 100% up to date, but there is um, a clear sign of escalation that's happening as a result of the Iranian embassy in Syria being targeted by the Israeli uh, IDF and uh, intelligence agencies. Um, and so that was is a serious escalation because an embassy, whether in a foreign currency, is considered as if bombing or murdering or committing a massacre on that particular country. And so that is a massive escalation. And at the moment, the countries all around the world are on red alert in terms of what that actually means. And remember, at the same time, um, this happened when there was the massacres on uh, British people, American people, Polish people, Australian people that were providing humanitarian aid within Israel for those that are going through the starvation and famine at the moment. Um, those workers were massacred. Um, and that was at the same time as an incredibly disgusting massacre in our Shifa hospital. Um, and then they had to derail it by targeting the Iranian embassy at the same time, causing a reaction that uh, led for the oil prices to spike up to $90 and everybody go through a reactionary cycle where the UK had to remove their support from Israel the U.S. started to fight back in their support, and there were allegations. Um, some people said it was fake news. I haven't really had time to verify it from Dubai and UAE saying that they are removing their support for Israel at the moment. Um, and so this is really at the same time as, you know, U.K. and U.S. saying that they will put their unequivocal uh, support by it and Europe are funding, you know, deciding whether they're going to be funding all of the additional support to the Ukrainian side at the moment as well. So we've got these two very large proxy wars between NATO and, you know, being fought by, unfortunately, Ukrainian people suffering as a result of this proxy war with Russia, and then the Middle, Middle East destabilization. And at the same time, um, last time before, since we went live, there was obviously the terror attacks that happened in Russia as well. Um, we know that that was attributed or taken cre uh, 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 credit by that four letter agency that begins with I and ends with S. And I don't want to say it because I'll get myself shadow banned on YouTube. We are very much shadow banned because of these types of topics uh, that we talk about. And we always know that that same four letter agency um, which is a complete terror organization, um, has also been used by many um, agent intelligence agencies over the years in order to destabilize regions, including the CIA and Mossad and MI5 and various other intelligence agencies. And so, you know, Moscow came out and Putin came out and said that they consider that an attack. They connected it to Ukraine in terms of their blame and the West connected it to that four letter terrorist organization that is used by um, intelligence agencies in order to destabilize the region. This is massive escalation and something we should be thinking about. And the impact of that will most certainly be, if this escalates with both Russia and Iran, 
is that we will be deciding whether we're eating or heating again as we get oil price increases and reactions of essentially more rich poor divide where people will be the governments and central banks will print money in order to um, fund these wars which then goes into the military industrial complex which creates inflation which means that the everyday person um, gets uh, has to pay the bill while the military industrial complex with those increased stock prices um, starts to get the benefit of the entire you know the geopolitical um, uncertainty as a result. And obviously that then has a Bitcoin play and then a macro play, which is why we must analyze Bitcoin uh, macro and geopolitics every single week in order to stay up to date with these trends. Um, there was a bit of a, you know, a uh, pullback from the, the lows with Bitcoin that we covered in the beginning of the show. Um, and uh, we also had the reaction on the Ethereum side. Now, people may ask me on Bitcoin Hard Talk, why do you talk about uh, Ethereum and the wider crypto markets? Well, I've been involved in the Bitcoin market from when it was just Bitcoin. And then we had like eight different coins that came up like Namecoin and Primecoin and Litecoin and everyone trying to make cheaper, faster, better uh, Bitcoin and all failing and still failing to this day. And we have to understand the wider crypto market when we're analyzing and understanding Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is the only digital hard sound money. But if you remember my previous broadcast, I uploaded to my uh, YouTube channel recently a space X recording. Um, and there was a previous episode of Bitcoin Hard Talk where I covered Bitcoin and money management. I talk about the concept of splitting up my money into four different buckets. One of those is spending technology. The other is saving technology, which is Bitcoin. And then a percentage of Bitcoin is used for investing. And investing is trying to accumulate more Bitcoin by taking additional risks. And obviously the fourth bucket is contribution. You can review previous videos or join the Bitcoin Hard Talk membership portal where we upload all of the previous broadcasts in one place um, which uh, is a free membership portal where you can get my free uh, book, the first published book in the world to include Bitcoin. You can get my Great Depression of the 2020s video series, and you can get everything else that uh, all the previous Bitcoin Hard Talk episodes. Um, so make sure you get yourself a free uh, login, and that's where I send out all my newsletters. Um, but the, five, the fourth bucket is contribution. And in the investment bucket, I use different mechanisms of ensuring that I end up and meet my rule. And my rule is that I must have more Bitcoin this month than the previous month. And that is a rule that I have been following ever since 2011 um, to ensure that I could exit the fiat currency proof of weapons network and live completely in the uh, proof of work network called Bitcoin. Um, and so ETH being caught classified as security is a journey that I've been through from the beginning uh, because I actually use Ethereum in order to end up with more Bitcoin uh, because Ethereum uh, converted and moved to something called proof of stake. We've covered that in previous videos. And that means that you can earn a stake by locking up your Ethereum. And in the investment bucket, I convert that to Bitcoin or I compound it to end up with more Bitcoin. Now, that does not mean that I think Ethereum is digital hard sound money. It certainly isn't. It goes into the investment bucket for that reason, because that is one of the ways of taking higher risk. And recently, it has not outperformed um, Bitcoin. It has in the past at different phases. And that's the point of an investment bucket um, is to take higher risk for potential higher returns that may not necessarily work out. And Ethereum is much, much more risky because throughout its history, it has changed all the time. And we are still arguing over whether it is a security or not, whether Bitcoin has been clearly defined as a commodity and in countries like El Salvador, a currency, which has significant tax benefits by being a currency as well. Um, so what the uh, report said is that subpoenas, we haven't got confirmation of this yet, but subpoenas were sent to the Ethereum Foundation. The Ethereum Foundation is a not-for-profit foundation set up in Switzerland that originally launched Ethereum and raised finance from the Bitcoin community in what at the time was definitely an illegal securities offering, 
uh, because the definition of a security in America is what's known as an investment contract. An investment contract by case law is determined by things like the Howey test. And the Howey test says that an investment contract is the giving of money in a common enterprise with the expectations of profits. Um, and what's the fourth part of it? The giving of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit. My God, I've done a blank on the fourth part of it. Someone will remind me um, in the comments. But anyway, if you meet that criteria, they consider that a um, a uh, a um, a security, an investment contract. Um, and so it was originally a security, no doubt about it, because I remember the pitch from Vitalik Buterin when he went out to the Bitcoin community and said that within seven months, we're going to create this new proof of stake network. Um, and uh, they launched it originally as a proof of work network, which had mining just like Bitcoin, but it had a different algorithm um, and uh, it was nowhere, you know, and they pre-mined it and various other things, which most likely makes it a security um, and why it is so different from Bitcoin. Um, but it was um, really this uh, subpoena has gone out um, and, uh, you know, the SEC is hunting for information. Now, my speculation is that they're probably hunting for information because a bunch of people have put in a ETF approval and what has been next. But I'll go through some of the predictions as a result of it. Um, and um, another speculation of why they might start doing this now is because remember, I talked about this concept of a pre-mine. The difference with Bitcoin is it was launched and Satoshi Nakamoto had to actually start mining Bitcoin. It's what's known as a fair launch. However, with Ethereum, a bunch of it was pre-mined and given to the Ethereum Foundation in order for developers to have some Ethereum um, and ETH so that they can use for development. Now, more recently, those foundational developers um, and some of the co-founders like Vitalik, and that's another reason why Bitcoin is different, because Vitalik is somebody that launched the project, pitched the project um, in the early days. I, full disclosure, did invest some of my Bitcoin into that token sale. You can invest one Bitcoin and get 2,000 ETH. But remember, that was part of my investment bucket as opposed to my savings bucket. Um, but it, you know, it launched essentially around 2015 after um, being pitched around 2014. It started where you had to mine it, but there was a pre-mine, as we said. And some of those people that had that pre-mine started selling it recently. Now, did that trigger off the SEC? Because the SEC considers, you know, and we'll go through some of the definitional stuff. None of this is legal advice, investment advice, or tax advice. Very important to do that. Read the disclaimers in the description. Um, but we used to actually, uh, again, we uh, at Bank to the Future, we used to create like we created an ETH miner back security where we sold it as a security and people could mine it and then it would be converted into Bitcoin or they could hold it as ETH and convert it into Bitcoin, which allowed them to end up with a larger Bitcoin position, which is the savings bucket. If you remember how we uh, talked about that and we were paying out a dividend every day because we were with the longest standing company in Bitcoin. We were one of the world's first we were the world's first crypto securities business, and we were always thinking of ways of allowing people to get more Bitcoin um, by using the fact that we would be able to construct these securities. So we did that way back around about 2015 when it was mining. Um, and, uh, you know, we started with that uh, Ether mining back security. Um, and uh, but at some point, Ethereum said that after about nine months, I remember the original pitch, it is going to convert to what's known as proof of stake. Now, proof of stake changes the environment because those that own it control it. So at the moment, those very same investors, um, they can you know uh, stake some ETH on Bank to the Future. They can have that auto converted into Bitcoin um, and they can use it in their investment bucket um, to uh, earn more Bitcoin. Um, or keep it as ETH, depending on what they want to do when they put together um, however they want to do it. And obviously, Ethereum became the second largest cryptocurrency. But once it moved to proof of stake, it changed the economics uh, because it was actually a fairly, you could argue, really, um, and the regulators have done this throughout time, that now Ethereum is sufficiently decentralized despite 
uh, some of the flaws. And that was actually given on the SEC websites in a presentation in 2018 by a gentleman known as Bill Henman. Um, and so in 2018, it was said that it is sufficiently decentralized. Um, and then obviously the SEC had a bit of a pivot to bring us to where we are right now. Well, um, ETH ended up really moving from proof of work to proof of stake. I think it was September 2022 when it started that process. And at that time, there was no SEC action. They could have gone for the Ethereum Foundation at that time. Um, but they decided to allow that. And there were other tokens that were proof of state tokens at the time. They even approved the ETH Futures ETF in October 2023. And in that approval, it classified Ethereum as a commodity, like it classified Bitcoin as a commodity as well. Um, and so really, this is, was, uh, you know, confirmed. And so people started to agree that sufficiently decentralized seemed to be the way it was classified as a commodity when launching that. Um, and uh, but they seem to be backtracking upon that. Now, why? What has changed? That is really the speculation. Some say it's because it switched to proof of stake. And when it switched to proof of stake, I did say that means that the exchanges and the banks and the ETF provider could end up controlling the whole network. And I do believe that that will be a geopolitical play in the future as we move to a central bank digital currency world um, or a full reserve banking world where stable coins disrupt full reserve banking. Um, and there will be a race to own all of those tokens to control the network, much like all of the banks got together on Jekyll Island in order to try and control the Federal Reserve and own the Federal Reserve to build the system in their favor. That's what happens when you transition from decentralized proof of, uh, proof of work as a bottom-up movement against the government um, and banks and central banks to proof of stake where whoever owns the stake controls the network. Um, but uh, they did not, you know, um, also there was a Coinbase. Remember, we were talking in the beginning when I did the overview in Bitcoin with the self-custody wallets um, in the Coinbase case. Well, they listed exactly which tokens Coinbase was listing that they classified as a security in the 2023 case and is still being determined. Of those 13 coins, they didn't list Ethereum. And so it's only until, you know, um, the more in a recent case um, in 2024, when the Bitcoin uh, ETFs got approved in Q1 this year, um, that people started to applying for the Ethereum ETFs as well. And that's when we started to see a slight pivot for clarity. And so what happens next? Well, what happens next with the ETF world is that in May the 23rd of 2024, which is only just round about a month away, just over a month away from now, um, they're going to have to accept, or is it two months, whatever it is, can't even, uh, the mental, losing track of time at the moment, things are moving so fast. Um, but they're going to have to approve or reject the Ethereum ETF. I think it's going to be a rejection. Now, originally the Bitcoin ETFs were approved, um, or sorry, rejected, and they rejected it based upon an excuse. So they have to give an excuse when doing it. And the excuse at that time for the Bitcoin ETFs was that Bitcoin can be manipulated, uh, which makes no sense because they already had Bitcoin futures approved. And those Bitcoin futures were based upon the underlying price of Bitcoin. And if Bitcoin can be manipulated, then why can it actually be? Why does it why does it matter for the ETF that it can be manipulated? Uh, why doesn't it matter for the futures, but does matter? And that was the argument that uh, Grayscale took to court when they wanted to convert the GBTC Bitcoin trust into an ETF. And they won that case in court. And because BlackRock was applying, that meant they didn't want to approve one um, Bitcoin ETF. Um, and so there was a mad rush in order to approve all ETFs at the same time. And they became the most successful ETF launches in history, according to Larry Fink of BlackRock. Um, and so because of all these different cases that have happened, because they lost the Grayscale case, which led to the Bitcoin ETF approval, uh, because they lost um, certain parts of the case against uh, Ripple 
as well, which is another company. Don't want to go into that case. You know, the SEC has somewhat lost a bunch of credibility. And so while there was a correction into the Ethereum price relative to Bitcoin, I think it's already factored into the price that this Ethereum ETF will likely be rejected in May and they will give their reason. What reason will they give? Most likely it will be something to do around staking and governance is my prediction. And that's probably why they're coming after the Ethereum Foundation uh, right now, because, you know, when they didn't, um, they probably make an argument that, uh, you know, when it changed. Um, and remember as well, if an Ethereum ETF and what some of them are doing that are trying to get these approved is they're saying, OK, we'll just launch a normal Ethereum ETF, not an Ethereum ETF where we stake the coins and return, receive the yield as a result um, of, you know, uh, setting up a validator that validates all the transactions. Um, but if you have an ETF, you know, so for example, if you're staking on Bank to the Future and will you rent our infrastructure in order to have your own validator and you are receiving yield, but you've got an ETF that's not receiving yield, then essentially that's dilutive because you're, um, the, the supply is increasing from those that are staking and those that aren't staking are not getting, you know, the additional yield. And therefore, you end up with an inferior product to something like staking through Bank to the Future and converting it to Bitcoin. Um, and so really, that is a reason, I think, to make the ETF not necessarily an interesting product. Um, and so that is what I think one of the tactics that may be used here, just in case it goes to litigation. And if it does go to litigation, what does the SEC want to be armed and ready with? Well, remember, there is a battle between the different regulators, all the different regulators, all the billions of dollars that it was fined to this industry. And then it comes out, you know, more legitimate at the end of it. Well, all of those three letter agencies want that money. Why? Because America, look at the geopolitical situation, is at a, you know, the end of a debt cycle. And so therefore, all the money that they can pull in the better. And many government agencies are looking at doing this, uh, you know, uh, looking at regulating the industry. They don't want the industry to go away. They just want to take the fines uh, every time. So essentially, that's how the banking system works. Once the banking system achieves a certain amount of power, you do the crime, you pay the fine, the government's happy, they get their money, they get their cut, and everything moves forward um, in the proof of weapons network. Now, with the centralized companies, you'll have the same type of situation because now they didn't shut down Bitcoin when they had the chance. It is now unstoppable with the level of security that goes behind the network. And the only thing that's left to do is determine, is it a commodity? Is it a currency? Or is it a security? And that then determines, does the tax authority get the money? Does the SEC get the money if it's a security? Or does the CFTC get the money? And they're on a battle with each other in the case of the US in order to do that. Now, one country is doing the right strategy. And I was trying for years, as you know, if you know my history, tried to do it in the UK, tried to do it in the Isle of Man, and then eventually ended up with President Bekele in El Salvador, uh, thanks to the Bitcoin community, um, getting him to uh, switch it, uh, make Bitcoin legal tender. It then becomes classified as a currency which is highly tax efficient and means that you can use it without creating taxable events every time you sell it, like you do in other countries that classify Bitcoin as a commodity. So Bitcoin with the CFTC, which is the regulator for the commodity, um, it means that you don't really, you treat it much like gold, but when you make gains, you have to pay capital gains. And so therefore holding it for the long term is much more beneficial as a commodity because you don't create those taxable events every time you do it. Um, and so obviously part of being ensuring that you do this correctly is understanding the tax implications and whether it's classified as a currency or a commodity. Now with a commodity, because Bitcoin, everyone understands the economics of Bitcoin and nobody, you, there's no door you can knock on. You can't go and find Satoshi Nakamoto, despite Dr. Craig Wright fraudulently claiming that he was in Dr. Craig Wright and it being proven in court, thanks to the, the syndicate that got together to spend the millions that now 
Craig Wright is uh, being considered a flight risk uh, because uh, he's got to pay the legal fees to the conglomerate that put it in uh, together. I think it was about $8 million in the end to prove that he's not Satoshi Nakamoto. And that was now ruled in court that he is a fraudster. Uh, but with commodities, you don't have to do like full disclosures and prospectuses um, and make sure that every quarter you're putting reports out there uh, for people to transparently know everything as you do with securities. And so securities, you have to have full disclosure. Um, you have to have public reporting requirements. You have to file your accounts with the SEC. And so the SEC wants to take it, um, Ethereum staking, from the CFTC um, so that it can be subjected to that. And essentially, even though at Bank to the Future, we can have, you know, we have securities licenses as well as virtual asset service provider registrations. So whichever way it goes, we can kind of cater for it. But treating it as a security has significant implications in terms of the future of the network. Now, if you don't understand that, I'd love to walk you down a little bit of history around um, Ethereum to understand the implications. And then I've already covered some of the predictions, but we can put forward some of the predictions so we can determine what's the impact for Bitcoin, what's the impact for Ethereum, and what's the impact for the wider macro geopolitical side. Just before I do that, um, I'm going to take a quick sip of water. And what I'd love for you to do, if you are watching this on YouTube, do me a favor, hit the like button. If you are watching this on the Twitter spaces and you would like to ask a question, raise your hand soon. I'm going to be jumping over there shortly and uh, Azad will come up as co-host and we'll start inviting you up and we'll take as many questions as we can in the AMA. And do me a favor as well. Please do retweet it. Please do share. If you're not a subscriber on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell symbol, hit all and YouTube will notify you even though we're shadow banned half the time. So do that right now while I take a quick sip of water and we'll get through to the second part where I'll go through some of the stories and history um, of Ethereum so that we can make some predictions and prepare accordingly. Um, so uh, I've already given a little bit of the, the background around this, but um, I originally got involved in the Bitcoin um, industry when I wrote the book um, that included Bitcoin in 2010. And then we launched it at the first Bitcoin conference in Prague in 2011. Um, and at that time, we were pivoting Bank to the Future, trying to create a fractional, res a, a full reserve bank, sorry. Um, and uh, because Bitcoin had already created the technology, we pivoted it into a securities business where we could allow people to invest in many of the companies that made the Bitcoin industry. At that time, there was only a few people investing in the industry, a guy called Roger Ver. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a journalist called Vitalik Buterin who worked for a company called Bitcoin Magazine. Um, and uh, he wanted to create all these different types of tokens on top of Bitcoin. He couldn't persuade the technology to shift because Bitcoin is decentralized. And we created this technology at the time. It was pretty clunky. It was called Bitcoin colored coins. Um, and these Bitcoin colored coins, um, everyone, we were investing in companies. Um, you know, we started um, allowing our investors to invest in many of the companies that are household names um, right now. Um, but uh, essentially Vitalik went out to the Bitcoin community and said, everyone, it sends a Bitcoin to this address. We'll give you 2000 ETH once we launch the network um, and told everyone what that uh, was. Now, now, no doubt that transaction was a security when it launched, but it was so early in the industry. Um, the regulators never did anything. Um, and, uh, you know, we were at that time launching different types of tokens on Bitcoin um, through networks, for example, we had Tether, which was one of the first coins that launched on top of uh, Bitcoin through this protocol called Omni, and people were doing token sales, um, and the industry started to emerge on Bitcoin. And then Ethereum launched, and they tried to optimize it so that you could create tokens. It wasn't competing as digital hard sound money, uh, but they essentially did an unregistered securities offering. Uh, they did the pre-mine, and they launched it as proof of work. Um, with a different type of algorithm. Don't want to go into the geeky because it's boring. Um, and that's when we launched our ETH mining back security, um, where it outperformed Bitcoin and people could convert their daily dividend into Bitcoin if they choose. Um, and then Ethereum launched and started launching securities on this own network. 
And for those of you that don't know, there was something launched called the DAO. It was a decentralized venture capital fund that was created and invested in by many of the people that were part of the Ethereum Foundation originally. And it very famously raised about 150 million. To put that in context, that was a massive number at the time. Ethereum itself only raised about 18 million and it almost went bankrupt because Bitcoin went into a bear market and they almost ran out of money before they could get the, um, the chain launched. Uh, but they did get it launched. And then the DAO was one of the first big use cases. And it raised about 150 million. And immediately afterwards, it got hacked for 62 million um, using the smart contract, using the fact that you know Ethereum was launched to say code is law. And they used that law in order to drain 62 million. Um, and the Ethereum Foundation and many of the buddies that invested in it and had the pre-mind decided that it was going to reverse the chain and take away those transactions, proving that it wasn't decentralized. Um, and so they reversed the chain. And actually, the version of Ethereum that you see today, it wasn't actually the original Ethereum. The original Ethereum is something called Ethereum Classic. The Ethereum you use today um, is an iteration, amorphous of a completely different hard fork chain. Um, and that was because it bailed out those that lost money in the DAO, uh, the DAO hack. And then the SEC came out and they launched a paper saying that the DAO is an illegal security. Um, and uh, because they reversed it, no one really lost money in that type of thing. Um, and uh, it went through this hard fork and proved, wow, you can just reverse the chain when a bunch of the founders lose a bunch of, bunch of money, which is why it's more risky and different from Bitcoin. Now it came on a lot and moved on a lot. It would be harder for the original founders to reverse the chain today. That would require certain types of consensus. But remember, they've got a bunch of the pre-mined coins. And if you got those coins, you own the network by having a stake in the network with proof of stake. And so that paper came out by the SEC and said, the industry, you are all warned. These are illegal securities offering. The industry didn't listen. In 2017, they took Ethereum, they launched all of these tokens, um, and we had the ICO initial coin offering, boom and bust cycle. And then the SEC came after all of these different issuers. And then the SEC came after the exchanges, said, you're offering illegal securities uh, when you're offering these different types of tokens that aren't Bitcoin. Um, and then it switched to proof of stake, as we said, and then people started to create these different types of tokens that allowed you to receive um, the yield from staking. Um, and then the SEC said any exchange offering those, staking as a service is an illegal securities offering. Obviously at Bank to the Future, we all did it as a security anyway. Uh, we don't work with US investors because we're registered um, with different regulators, but we were able to offer those because uh, we are registered, whether it's a currency, a commodity or a security. Um, we've been working um, to be able to offer all those different services um, without there. Um, and then literally the SEC, the next thing is that they're trying to come after stable coins. But because the uh, Fed sees it as a risk to the banking system, when you disrupt fractional reserve banking with full reserve banking, you have this friction between all the different regulators. And so the Fed comes along and they say, you know, we want the OCC, I think the information commissioner of the currency. Uh, they want to regulate it because they think it's risky in the banking side. But that then has tax implications because then you might have to make it legal tender because if you treat it as a commodity, there's a bunch more tax. So you see how these agencies um, have different types of, um, you know, policies there. Um, and then the CFTC say that they treat Bitcoin and classified it as a commodity. The SEC said, yeah, we don't have jurisdiction over Bitcoin, which is why Bitcoin was then able to go through the ETF approval process. And now the SEC says we're going to come after the Ethereum Foundation. Allegedly, this is the allegation um, and do a document request. Now, as we said, we don't know whether it's from the early token sale, whether it's because they see it um, actually because of staking as a security. My guess is that they will lose. And this is where we can start go through some of the predictions. Because no matter what, I believe that there will be a fourth type of regulator in the US that will have to do what the rest of the world is doing, which is custom regulations called a virtual asset service provider. 
At Bank to the Future, one of our companies is a registered virtual asset service provider with custom regulations for the industry. So you don't have all the stuff that you had at FTX and the fraud that you had at Celsius with illegal securities. And then when things are investments, we can sell it in compliance with securities laws, with disclosures. And when they are currencies um, or virtual assets, you know, you can have all of it fully segregated and not the situation where, you know, a hedge fund is using client money and then you have to be audited to meet all those requirements. The reason that we had that fraudulent industry is because the regulators didn't put together the custom regulations that makes this industry make sense. Um, and that's why, you know, we were able to offer the ETH staking solution at Bank to the Future. Um, but anyway, what are the predictions? Well, I believe that even if they come after to say that ETH, the underlying token, is a security, based upon all the case law so far, they will lose. So what are they doing? Well, I believe that they are subpoenaing the Ethereum Foundation in order to get all the information that they need to reject the ETFs in case there is litigation, just like what happened with the Bitcoin ETF. They get forced into approving it because Greystale launched a case. They want all, they didn't have the information. They said it was market manipulation, but they're going to have to come up with their excuse. So I believe in May, they will reject the Ethereum ETF and everyone will apply again. It will go through another cycle. And I think the reason that they will reject it is because they'll say, we don't know how you're going to deal with governance and we don't know how you're going to deal with staking. And that requires more clarity because it's so different to Bitcoin. But this time that will be met with legislation. And that legislation will then probably lead to another court case, probably through someone like Coinbase or Kraken that want to offer this service. Um, and they want to be ready and armed with all the information that they can get from the Ethereum Foundation. I do believe that they will lose in the end and that in the end, they will um, get the ETF approved eventually. I think it's factored into the price already because people saw it as a low chance of approval. Um, the litigation will probably go ahead and then eventually you'll get a new regime with the new political regime. I predict that it's gonna be the Trump regime. Um, I think that that's gonna be, that's certainly gonna be happening. And then maybe you'll have a virtual asset service provider regime under either the, you know, the OCC or the CFTC, whether they treat it as a currency or commodity, that's mainly a tax conversation. And obviously they'll treat it as a commodity because it's a money grab of all of these trillions of dollars of market cap that's being created as the whole world starts to realize that Bitcoin is the hardest, soundest digital form of money that the world has ever seen and the best savings technology to protect people from the proof of weapons network and all the atrocities that governments are creating in the macro side with the Ponzi schemes and the geopolitical side with the proof of weapons network propped up by military industrial complexes. When you combine those together, you end up with wealth inequality that drives the debt cycles that we have seen. Um, and then eventually they want a tax grab Stable coins bring stability in banking that launches their use case for the central bank digital currency model. And as I've always said, America transitions away from its capitalist ideal over to communism on a blockchain in the end. And there is a grab around who's going to con control it and regulate it um, uh, with the Ethereum side anyway. And I think it still wins as a geopolitical tool. And so I will still continue to have Bitcoin as my savings technology and Ethereum will have a place in order in my investment bucket in order to try and end up with more Bitcoin each month. And so now we're going to head over uh, right on the hour to uh, X spaces um, and just a few messages before we close up. Uh, firstly, make sure you have a login if you want to prepare yourself for a Bitcoin and central bank digital currency world. Uh, make sure you have a free login to the Bitcoin Hard Talk membership portal, which can be found by going to simondixon.com uh, forward slash Bitcoin Hard Talk. Uh, you can get a free login. You just put your name in there. 
Um, and then I'll email you my newsletter. You can get all of the different tools to prepare you for a Bitcoin and CBDC world. I'm going to be doing my uh, annual video series that I launch out there for completely for free for everybody to build and protect their wealth during what I've been calling the Great Depression of the 2020s. Uh, make sure you have your login so you can get access to that. Um, and today I'm going to be experimenting with the live AMA. Um, but this time I'm going to be doing it on Twitter spaces. So if you follow me on X, um, head over to at Simon Dixon Twit, um, raise your hand right now, and I'm going to head over to there um, now that we are done with the live broadcast. So always remember you are alive at one of the most interesting and exciting times in financial history. Unfortunately, many are going to get wrecked. Others are going to do really well. And I want to make sure that you are the right side of this change. And we have a network called Bitcoin Proof of Work that does it with peace, love, and unity while we get all the violence from the Proof of Weapons Fiat Currency Network that escalates us into a new monetary renegotiation and world of Bitcoin and central bank digital currencies. So I will see you right now over on X Spaces, or I'll see you in the membership portal if you're watching the recording. Peace.